Welcome to the viewfinder tutorial. I hope you enjoy. It's going to be quite long and it's not a beginner's tutorial. There are a few other pieces of information that I do want to share before going into the tutorial for those who aren't ready to invest almost two hours of their time for something that they may not actually want. So what you see currently behind is the final-ish result that you'll be getting. The collisions are a bit weird due to how the collisions were set up on this specific object, which is why I can walk on the ground even though it's not there. There are also some things I need to discuss before going into the project as they're worth addressing, as for some people it might be a reason not to follow the project. So I'm going to address them now. If you have a problem with any of these, then the tutorial is likely not really for you. So the issues can be divided into kind of two main topics. The first one is this tutorial will give you an imperfect final product, right? You can't just take what I'm making here and apply it to a game and call it Viewfinder. It's not finished, it can't be done in only a few hours to have a final game, obviously. So there are still some glitches here and there, but through some more trial and error, if you want to make it better, you can. It's definitely possible. The second point I want to touch upon, the second point is there's a strange issue with the slicing mechanic for the procedural meshes that we'll be using. And that problem is, unless you're using a uniformly scaled object, the slices end up being a bit strange. And by a bit strange, I mean they're stretched or they're not in the right location or they're rotated strangely. So everything has to be scaled uniformly. Otherwise, you'll have issues with it. So that makes it good for final products, but not very good for prototyping. So please keep that in mind before watching the tutorial. With that, we've got the issues out of the way, and so we can start the tutorial. So to start the tutorial, open a first person character project, or if you already have a project ready, feel free to use that one. In my case, I have the same project that I use for the laser tutorials. So I have a copy of the first person character here, as you can see. There's nothing inside of it. It's completely blank slate based on the original third person character. In addition to the first person character, I also have an asset pack that I'm going to be using for the procedural meshes. So I would suggest getting one for yourself as well because it will make testing a lot easier due to the scaling constraint. So I have the Brutalist Office pack, which is currently free at the moment, so feel free to grab it on the marketplace if you want it. So we're going to start this tutorial off by creating all the assets we need straight away. That way we can move on forwards without having to create new stuff later. So we'll start with the inputs. So create a folder for that, call it inputs. Inside of the folder, we're going to make two input actions. The first we can call IA underscore capture the second IA underscore zoom. And then we can right click on one of them and say create input mapping context, which we'll call IMC underscore viewfinder. Now that you've created your input mapping context, open it up and we're going to add our inputs Press the plus sign and add IA capture and IA zoom. And select left click and right click. Now you can close the inputs as we're not going to be using them anymore. And we can start creating our new assets. We'll start off by creating our actor component for the first person character. So right click, select blueprint class, and look for actor components. We'll call it AC underscore viewfinder. Next up, we're going to need a camera actor. So go ahead once again and select a blueprint class and select actor. We can call it A underscore camera. Then we're going to need two more actors, one for the photo, which we'll call A underscore photo.
And the next one for the procedural meshes, which we'll call a underscore procedural base, as we're going to need a child class of it later. Next, we're going to need a structure, which you'll be able to find in the blueprints tab. And we're going to use it to stock all of the information for the meshes. So we're going to call it st for structure underscore photo info. Next, we're going to make our render target, which is going to be serving the purpose of taking an actual screenshot of sorts for our photo. We can find it under the texture tab. Make sure you select render target and not render target 2D or cube. And we'll call it RT underscore photo one. Next up is a basic old material that we'll be using to apply our render target to a surface. We can call the material M underscore RT underscore photo. Next is our camera visual, which we'll be doing with a user widget. So go ahead and right click and select user interface and widget. Go ahead and select user widget. And we'll call it UMG underscore camera. To finish up with the assets, we're going to right click on our procedural base and we're going to create a child blueprint which we'll call the same, but replace base by physics. Before getting to work on our blueprints, we're going to have to import a basic texture for the camera UMG. So I put a link in the description to a Google Drive that I'm using. Feel free to go and download it there and then import it into the project. So with everything ready, we're free to start now making our project. So. Let's start with the UMG camera. So go ahead and open that up. Once inside, we're going to search for a scale box and add that to our widget. Make sure you set its stretch to fill instead of scale to fit. Now we can add our canvas panel to the scale box. And the final widget we'll be adding is the image widget which we need to make sure that we set the anchor to fill and make sure all of the offsets are set to zero. Once that's done, we want to go ahead and set our brush texture to the image we imported called camera HUD. So we go ahead and do that by pre-selecting it in the content browser and using the small arrow to select it. Compile and save the widget, and we can close it as we won't be touching it anymore. Next up, we'll be setting up the structure. So open up ST photo information. For the structure, we're going to start off by replacing the Boolean with a static mesh type, or we'll also call it static mesh. Next will be a materials variable with a type called material interface, and it'll be an array, not just a single variable. Next up is a variable we'll call physics, which will take in a Boolean. Then we want a transform, which we'll call transform as well, which will act as an indicator of where relatively in space we want to spawn our actors we've taken in photo. Next is the, probably the most complicated one, which is slices, which is going to be a map of vectors. It'll be vectors for both the keys and the values. So feel free to add a tooltip like me for keys equal normals. and values equal position. Next, we're going to add a variable of type vector as well, 
but it's simply an array. So swap the map back to an array and we'll call it valid points. And finally, the last variable will be of type integer and we'll call it old cuts. With that, we're done with our structure, so we can go ahead and close it. Next, we're going to have a look at the render target. Now, please note that for the render target, we don't have to change anything unless you want to have a higher quality photo. By default, it is set to 256 by 256. If you want a higher quality, you can increase that value, but make sure both values are equal. Next, we want to go and open the material for a render target. And with the default values selected, we want to change the shading model from lit to unlit. Next, we want to get a texture sample, which will then plug into the emissive color. Upon connecting the node, you'll probably get an error. To solve this error, simply select a texture. In our case, we want to take the render target we made. To finish the material, we can convert our texture sample to a parameter and we'll call it render target. We can apply the changes and close the material. Now I'm going to make a material instance based on our material, but we don't actually use it in the tutorial. This is just in the event that, for instance, you would want to have multiple photos, just as why we called our render target, render target photo one. So you don't need to make this material instance if you don't want to, but if you're interested in having, for instance, multiple materials, multiple photos, then feel free to leave a comment and let me know if that's something that you want and I can do an extra part of this tutorial for that. But continue with this tutorial, Let's go and open the first person character and we're going to add our actor component to it. So in the components search for AC underscore viewfinder. In my case, I also have AC hold, which is from the other tutorial, um, the lasers. So just add your AC viewfinder to it and we'll be done with the first person character. Next up, we're going to be setting up our actor for the photo that the player will be holding upon capturing an image. Inside a photo, the first thing we want to add is a plane component. So go ahead and add that by searching for it in the components tab. You're going to want to modify the scale and set it to 0.25 on the X and the Y and leave it at one on the Z. In addition, we want to rotate it by 90 degrees on the Z axis. And to finish up the photo actor, we want to create a variable we'll call photo information and the type of the variable will be our structure that we created. So search for st underscore photo info and then make sure you turn it into an array. Before we close our photo actor, we need to make sure that we set our plane material to our m underscore rt photo. Now we can finally get started with our main topic for this video, and that's going to be our actor component viewfinder. So go ahead and open up the actor component blueprint. We're going to start the actor component by getting rid of our event tick because we won't be using it at all. And then we're going to start with setting up our inputs. So for the inputs, we want to get player controller. From our return value, we want to drag out and get enhanced inputs. Once you've got that, we want to drag out and say add mapping context. Attach the execute to the event begin play. And for the mapping context, we'll select our IMC viewfinder. With that done, we can now call our IA zoom and our IA capture from within our actor component. We'll be adding them later, but for now we can just put IA zoom to see that it works. Next, we're going to create the camera widget. So go ahead and search for create widget. For the class, go ahead and select UMG camera. 
and instead of adding it to viewport we're going to promote it to a variable which we'll call as umg underscore camera next we're going to set up our actual physical camera which will be a scene capture so to do that we're going to need to get owner the reason we need the owner is because you can't attach a component to a actor component so we're going to drag from the return value and search for add component by class for the class make sure you select scene capture component 2d once you've selected the class you'll be able to get access to the relative transform you can split that and set the x location to 10. take the return value and promote to a variable we'll call as scene capture 2d Also, before I forget, make sure you check the manual attachment. To finish setting up the spawn of our capture component 2D, we want to get, once again, a reference to our owner, and we're going to want to get component by class. The component we're looking for is the camera component, as we want to attach our physical camera for the game to our player camera. Now we want to get a reference to our new variable we just created and call attach component to component. For the parent, we want to attach the get component by class return value. Now we're going to be setting up the parameters for our scene capture component. Now make sure you pay close attention here, especially for the field of view that it's the same as mine. Otherwise, the values throughout the tutorial will be incorrect for your field of view. Get a reference to your scene capture and search for set texture target. Set the texture target to our render target underscore photo one. Once we've tidied up the nodes a bit, next, still from scene capture, we want to set capture every frame we want to leave it as false as we're going to be only capturing one specific frame which can be called with a different function later for the same reason we also want to call set capture on movement and also leave that one as false as we don't want to capture on movement we want to capture once we click a button and one last boolean which will be always persist rendering state, which will leave false. And the final parameter we'll be setting is the field of view. So search for set field of view, and the value we'll put in is 23.5. With that, we've set up our scene capture component. Next, we're going to be adding the last few variables we'll be needing inside of this actor component. The first variable we'll be adding is a means of checking if we are currently holding a photo. And so we'll simply create a Boolean we'll call has photo. Next, we'll create another variable called as a underscore photo, which will be of type a underscore photo which will act as a reference to our photo that we are holding. Now we can start setting up our logic for the actor component. So we can finally add our second input action. So search for IA capture. We'll start by setting up our zoom. So we want to drag from started and add a branch. The condition being has photo, as we won't be performing the same actions if we have a photo in hand or not. Before going further, it's probably more interesting that we create our functions that we'll place before, even if we leave them empty for now. So let's go ahead and do that. The first function we'll make will be called focus on photo. We'll be calling focus on photo on the true part of the branch. On false, we want to get a reference to our UMG camera and we're going to search for add to viewport. Next, we're going to deal with what actions we should perform on the release of the zoom button. 
we can start by copying our branch with the condition has photo and attach it to the completed output. Next, we'll just duplicate our focus on the photo and rename the new function to lose focus on photo. On true, we'll add the lose focus on photo function. And on false, we'll call our as umg camera and say remove from parent. Next, we're going to get into the capture logic. So for the capture, we're only going to use the started output. So from the started output, we want to once again put our branch with has photo as condition. From the false output, we want to add a, another branch. Then we want to get as umg camera and we want to call is visible from our umg camera and that'll be our condition. Next, we're going to need another function that will be our capture photo function. Once the function's been created, we'll add it to the true output. In addition to the capture photo function, we also want to call from our UMG camera, remove from parent. And to finish, the final function we'll make will be the place photo function, which will be on the first true branch of the capture input. So with all the functions created, now we can get into making them actually work. So we'll start with the capture photo as all the other ones don't work if we don't have a photo first. We'll start the capture photo function by getting a reference to our scene capture and calling the capture scene function. Well, before we actually capture our scene, we need to have something to capture to. So we're going to get a reference to our scene capture and get its world transform. And then we want to transform rotation and set the values to 80 on the Y axis. From the executable, drag out and call spawn actor from class. The class we want to select is the A underscore photo class. Then go ahead and split the spawn transform and attach our transform rotation to the spawn transform rotation. From the return value, we want to drag out and set as a photo. So before we go any further, I just realized a quick mistake I made. Uh, we need to go back and open our a photo actor and we need to disable the collision on the plane as we don't want it to be interacting and causing the player to bug out as it doesn't need any collision. Back in our AC underscore viewfinder, we want to get a reference to our scene capture 2D and we want to call attach actor to component. And the actor we'll be attaching is our as a underscore photo. Attach the function like you see on screen with as a photo to target and as scene capture 2D to parent. You can uncheck well dissimulated bodies. And then we want to get another reference to our as a photo and set actor relative location. Set the new relative location to 45, minus 30, and minus 15. To finish the function, we can go ahead and get our as scene capture 2D and capture scene function that we made in the beginning and put it at the end of the function. We can now go ahead and finally test the actual project because now we finally made something that will actually be visible. So go ahead and run the project. So normally if everything's been done correctly, when you right click, you can actually see the UMG of our camera appear. 
and if you release it, it will disappear. If whilst holding you left click, you will have a photo, oh, well, apparently there's an error, the photo doesn't appear, so something went wrong. So let's try and figure out what that is. In addition to the photo not appearing, you probably noticed the yellow text error. So to change that, you just need to check the always persist rendering state. To solve the issue of the photo not appearing, what we need to do is go into capture photo and on the set actor relative location, we need to set teleport to true. And as you can see, if we run the project, hold right click to look into the camera and left click, we have a photo that appears on the left part of the screen. So the reason I didn't initially check the always persist rendering state and why the warning text was still there is because in my test project, it caused issues on the image artifacts, if you will. So I didn't check it, but here we can check it and we'll see the message does disappear. And also for some reason here, the image is perfectly clear with no artifacts at all. So if that's the case for you, then just leave it checked. That's not a problem. It doesn't seem to cause any other issues from my testing. So after those few tests, now we can move on to placing the photo with quotation marks for now. But one last thing I forgot to do is inside capture photo, we need to go back and add has photo and set it to true. Next, we're going to make our place photo function. We'll start by calling set has photo and putting it to false and then getting a reference to as a photo and calling destroy act. Next, we can test the level to see if we're indeed placing the photo. And after running it, we can definitely see that it does disappear, but there's a little issue in how it disappears. The reason the disappearance is weird may not be obvious at first. Before we actually fix that, we're going to modify the focus on photo function. So inside, the first thing we're going to do is going to get a reference to as a photo. And we want to set actor relative location. The new relative location should be 50 on the X and make sure you check teleport. In addition, we also want to set actor relative rotation to 90 on the Y. You'll also need to check the teleport, but to get it, you need to expand the node. Now we can run the project again and see if the changes we made run as intended. And as we can see, when we right click and left click to take a photo, it appears in our left hand. And if we right click again with the photo, we actually zoom in on it and it will appear in the middle of the screen. Now back inside of the AC viewfinder, we want to set up the lose focus of photo function. Start by getting a reference to our A photo actor and then set relative location. We can also get set relative rotation once again, make sure you check the teleport on both the location and rotation. Set the rotation to 80 on the Y. And for the location, 45, minus 30, and minus 15. And with that, we're finished with the lose focus on photo and all the basics. So let's run another test to see if everything works. And now we can zoom in and zoom out of the photo without any issues. Now, before we finish this part, there's one last little change we need to make, and that is for the placing the image. By default, there is no conditions for the place photo, but we only want to be able to do it when we're focusing it. We need to create a new variable of type boolean that we'll call focused. At the end of the lose focus function, we'll set is focus to false, and in the focus on photo function, we'll set it to true. And finally, in the event graph on the capture input, before the place photo, we want to do a branch and check is focused. And on true, we'll place the photo. And with that, we have finished the first part of this tutorial, which was mainly taking a photo and simply placing it or putting the code to place the photo. In the next parts, we'll be doing all the procedural mesh, the cutting, and everything that you would put with the viewfinder mechanic. If you have any feedback or questions concerning the video, feel free to leave a comment. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next part of the tutorial.